started. All right, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to have everybody here this evening. Um, hopefully, um, Shauna Taylor can be here shortly. I think she did confirm she would be here. Is that right? Yeah, so, um, but we'll, we'll get going. Again, thank you for being here. This is really more of a, um, we're going to do a little bit of introductions this evening. We're going to go over some basic information. Um, and I'm assuming that none of the board members, and I know this is not the case, but I'm just go we're going to operate as if some of the board members or the board does not have a real strong understanding and background of uh, community redevelopment areas or economic development activity that cities um, undertake. And so I think it will be really helpful. Okay. Um, I think that'll be really helpful to uh, to take that approach. And I, I know I so nobody, please don't feel like you're, um, you know, we're not talking down to anybody. Um, it, it's just that's that's the way we'll start off, and we'll quickly we'll quickly all get to a uh, a state where we can really move. So, yeah, let's. Um, we have an agenda. We'd like to follow. Can we? Go advance to the agenda page, please. The screen, I think it's one, there we go. Okay, so let's, um, let's begin by calling roll. And Renee, our board secretary, uh, Renee Yother is gonna do that for us. So Renee, please. Here. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'd like to begin by having everybody introduce themselves. Um, I'm not sure who knows who on the board. Um, and I'll start and we'll just kind of, how about if we just kind of move our way around this way. And Stuart, you'll, uh, you'll get the grand crescendo. Uh, my name's Dave Dickey. I'm the city's community and economic development director. Um, the department deals with, a, seems like, a lot of things, um, and uh, commu community development and economic development are two of those things. We also deal with building and planning and code enforcement and community redevelopment agencies and whatever Todd, our city manager, would like us to do that particular day. Um, so we're, we stay very, very busy. Um, but our department has been tasked to work with this board, um, and we'll, uh, so we'll, we'll get to work a lot with each other moving forward, so. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Kyle Harris. I am the senior planner uh, for the city of Cape Canaveral. I've been here about a year. Um, so I, I think I'll have a lot of things that, that you guys will be looped in on. We have a lot of, a lot of things we're working on. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm Anthony Garganesi, the city attorney and the CRA board attorney. Don Mays, um, property owner in Cape Canaveral. Um, we own a bunch of commercial properties here. And also the CEO of Call One and Hello Direct. We sell telecommunications devices and audio video conferencing equipment. Ron Foligno. I am presently the owner of the Oceanside Distillery over on West Central Boulevard. Prior to that, I was a design build general contractor and architect in Brevard County for over 25 years. A lot of land development experience and public projects. My name is Tom Hermanson. I uh, live in Merritt Island. Uh, local developer, property owner uh, with a decent amount of projects here in Cape Canaveral. Uh, that covers it. I'm Jane Seda, and I live in Cape Canaveral. I am an intellectual property attorney and have my own practice. Chelsea Partridge, engineer at Lockheed Martin, formerly elected to the Brevard Soil and Water Conservation District, former president of the Missile Space and Range Pioneers, and former member of the Economic Development Council of the Space Coast. Uh, Stu Smith, Cape Canaveral resident, CEO of the Florida Association of Veteran-Owned Businesses. All right. Todd, did you want to? I'm Todd Morley, City Manager, City of Cape Canaveral. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think we have a good group here to uh, put together. I'm looking forward to it. Um, 
So we've done the roll call. Uh, typically, our board, our board meetings, we have a section called public participation. We're not, no public here this evening, so we won't be getting, getting involved in that. But that's typically, typically an opportunity for anybody from the public to speak about anything they would like to, whether it's on the agenda or not. Um, generally, actions that come up under that section of the agenda aren't, there's no, no action by the board that's required. So, but typically, that is a requirement that we, that we have in our, in our public meetings. Um, really no old business or new, but we do have some new business. Um, and this evening, I think what we would like to do is really focus on, as I said earlier, um, kind of sensitizing the board to the city's um, situation with respect to economic development and specifically with the, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Shauna, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm a little late, sorry. That's okay. Um, with respect to the city CRA, um, Anthony is going to give us a presentation on that. Uh, he'll give you some of the details on what CRAs are, how they're created, what their function is, what you can do with a CRA, things like that. Um, their creation is embedded in uh, statute, so there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a process. Um, but Anthony will, will give us some information on that. Um, at the conclusion of Anthony's presentation, I will give us a very brief overview of the city's economic development action plan. Um, I know that the CRA plan as well as the economic development action plan were provided to you uh, approximately a week ago. Uh, they're both fairly significant documents, so don't feel bad if you haven't got through each one of those completely. Um, there may be some homework after the meeting today. Um, and we'll, uh, but we'll, we'll talk away through that and see exactly how the board would like to proceed. Um, we also, this evening, are going to elect a chair and a vice chair. I think Anthony and I talked a little bit about that, and we'll probably do that after the uh, presentation um, presentations. It, it is. We were going we were gonna jumble that a little bit, unless Anthony, you wanted to go through and whatever, whatever they want to do. Okay. You can do it first, or you can wait. Okay. Then let's go ahead and do that. Um, what we need from the board is we'll be we'll be electing a chair and a vice chair from amongst the seven members. Um, and so how that's handled typically is we'll receive nominations uh, from the board members themselves on on whether they would like to you can nominate yourself, you can nominate other members of the board. And, um, and if, if there is more than one nomination for either the president or, or excuse me, the chair or the vice chair, uh, we'll, we'll have a, um, we'll have a uh, roll call vote. Um, but I think just, let's just jump right into it. Does anybody have a feeling on if, if you'd like to nominate another member of the board for I'd like the to chair? Nominate, I'd like to nominate Don Mays, chair of the board. All right. Don, is that something you'd be interested in doing? If the, no one else is interested, I don't mind. Um, Are there any other nominations? What exactly yeah, what, would these people be doing, the chair? And the... the chair will be leading the meetings, Okay. Um, kind of what I'm doing now. Uh, the chair will be stepping up and handling all of that. They'll be running the meetings. They'll be making sure the meetings operate smoothly. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to follow Robert rules of orders exactly, uh, but they'll, they'll run, they'll be responsible for running a, um, a, a efficient meeting, um, taking um, votes, leading votes, um, basically just leading the meeting, um, facilitating an efficient, efficient, productive meeting. Um, and then the vice chair will be um, there in case the chair is not able to attend. The vice chair can step up and run the meeting should the, should the chair not be available. Yeah, and I do, I will say, I do have quite a bit of travel over the next 12 months for work. So it would be great to have a strong vice chair, please. Okay. That would be my only request. Okay. Well, let me ask again, are there any other, other nominations for chair? Of can the I second the motion that's on the table? Okay. Well, Don, um, Anthony, I'm not. Do we need to do a roll call if there's? Okay. Call the roll for now. Okay. If there's a second. So this this will be a vote. Uh, this will be a vote for Don Mays as chair. Don I four. Yes. Four. 
abstain? Uh, I don't think I can vote. <laughs> no, you, can, no, you can vote for yourself. Okay. Yes. Four. Yes. Four. Congratulations. Thank um, you. So our first order of business is asked for nominations for the vice chair. Yeah. Who wants it? Nobody <laughs> said. Does anybody have any experience in uh, being a chair or a vice chair? I think uh, I heard somebody college. talking about their. Uh, I've, had, I've, I, had the, I've had the displeasure of having to chair a number of public. public I've. Yeah, my immediate request, my nomination would be Tom Hermanson just based oh, on his experience. Man. But, is, is but that's back. fair because he nominated me, so it's just <laughs> fair. It's just turnaround. Payback. Yeah. All right, so Tom has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? You got it. All right, Renee, I guess we need to do another roll call. I don't know. Do we need a second? I'll second if we need it. Okay. I don't think so, but that's okay. Yes. Got it. Four. 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 Yes. Four. Thank you, Mr. Hermanson. Congratulations. Uh, um, we just have to make sure we don't plan trips on the same week. That's that's the only thing. Yeah. Ms. Chairman, would you, if you'd like, uh, Anthony can now um, proceed to his presentation on the. Absolutely, please go ahead, Anthony. On the CRA. Okay. Um, Renee's going to help me because we don't have a clicker, so she's she'll move the slides along. Did a quick PowerPoint presentation just to kind of give you an overview. I think it's very important that. Um, you know, right off the bat, we just define, define for the board what exactly your role is because you know, the, the role that you've been assigned or delegated by, this, by the city council is your, is with, is your purview um, and you need to kind of stay in your lane. So um, name, as you know, naming the, the board, Business and Economic Development Board that was created by city council ordinance. And the role, the next slide. And then go to the next slide after that, too. We'll go right into that. So under the city code, the city council has, has delegated um, uh, a dual advisory role to the bed board. First, uh, to serve as a citizen advisory committee uh, related to business and economic development issues. And then second, the, the role is uh, to serve as an advisory board regarding uh, community redevelopment. Next slide. So this dual role um, that you have, first and foremost, and this has been the historical role of BED board, is business and economic development. And under the city code, uh, you, that responsibility, the BED board is, it should be advising the city in general, that includes staff and the city council, the city manager, uh, regarding nine enumerated items. The ninth one is uh, no longer applicable. I'll explain that in a second. So the first is implementation of the, the city's economic and business development policies. You'll hear David talk a little bit about uh, that um, later on um, to give advice regarding the development of commerce within the city of Cape Canaveral, trying to encourage high value business investment and identifying any barriers to economic development for uh, desired businesses and the creation of economic incentives. Uh, as requested by the, by the staff of the city council is act as a liaison related to public relations regarding uh, other organizations in the community such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Port, the EDC, et cetera. Also to give advice regarding actions to develop and implement uh, development of the city's commerce within the city. Um, also to provide advice regarding timely and appropriate recognition of new commercial activity cooperate and provide aid and advice to community groups dedicated to commercial expansion within the, within the city. Also to provide advice to encourage development of business, commerce, and industry as well as, well as tourism. Um, and lastly, uh, to give advice to 
provide some investigations if necessary regarding sources of financial assistance from the government and the private sector related to economic and business development. The private sector is, um, with respect to the code, it refers to foundations um, in terms of if, if there's any financial assistance that foundations could provide. Uh, lastly, the, they used to, the bed board used to provide um, recommendations regarding the merits of ad valorem tax exemption applications. Um, the, that law has now expired, so you, you won't serve in that capacity at all. The city historically has only had one, um, one uh, company that has qualified for ad valorem tax exemption when the law was in effect. Um, so next slide. The newest and, and, and probably, in my opinion, the more interesting um, is the community redevelopment aspect of the bed board. <clears throat> the city council um, back in um, 2012 created the uh, community redevelopment agency, which is a fancy, fancy term for nothing other than a special, gov a special local government district. Um, the city council appointed itself as the governing board of the community redevelopment agency. And, um, and, and that the city council serves, you know, not only as the city council, but has another hat when it serves on uh, CRA uh, business. And um, recently the city council modified the, um, the ordinances to create a community redevelopment advisory uh, board and um, assigned those responsibilities to the bed board. So, when you, when you deal with community redevelopment issues, um, first and foremost, if there's any modifications to the community redevelopment plan in the future, uh, the ordinance requires that the bed board make a, a recommendation. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the community redevelopment plan because that is the, the basic governing uh, document for the, for the CRA agency. It's probably the most important governing document that the, uh, the agency has, and, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later. So when you serve in the capacity of, of making recommendations regarding the modification of the CRA plan, um, you need to know that th that, is, that is a very, very important document for the CRA. Um, and then also there's a catch-all that any other duties and responsibilities that are formally delegated uh, by the CRA board related to the implementation of the community redevelopment plan uh, will also come to the to this board for advice and recommendations. Uh, next slide. So, as I community redevelopment, um, just to give you a very simplified overview, so you can understand um, how compartmentalized the role of a community redevelopment agency is. So the, the, the Florida legislature has adopted, adopted back in 69, the Florida Community Redevelopment Act of 1969, which gave local governments like counties and cities the ability to create these special districts called community redevelopment agencies. And as I noted, the council created that um, agency in 2012. The primary purpose of a community redevelopment agency is first to prevent and eliminate slum and blight. The second is to preserve um, or enhance the tax base. And primarily that means the ad valorem tax base, which of course is a major revenue source uh, for the city and is for all essentially is the only revenue source for the CRA. And I'll explain that in a second. So now the CRA not only has a primary purpose, but the CRA must, must act within a certain defined geographical area. As you know, the city council works within a, a certain geographical area. It works within the entire jurisdictional limits of the city of Cape Canaveral. Well, CRA has to do the same thing, but there in Cape Canaveral's case, the geographical area of the CRA is less than the overall boundaries of the city. So it's a, it's a more refined, although very large, um, area of the city of Cape Canaveral, and Dave's gonna go over the map. Um, so when CRA agencies act, okay, they have to act 
regarding matters within that geographical area. So they can't do things in other parts of the city that aren't within the CRA area. So that's very important to keep in mind because it geographically limits the authority of the, of the, of the uh, CRA. So the CRA must perform um, within this geographical area community redevelopment undertakings, activities, and projects and related activities. Now, community redevelopment and related activities are defined by Florida law. Um, so they're terms of art. The um, community redevelopment is you know, rede you know, redeveloping properties, uh, you know, removing slum and blight, demolition of buildings, you know, incentivizing redevelopments, you know, all the kind of the nuts and bolts of, um, you know, just what you would generally think of as redevelopment. Uh, projects, construction projects. Um, related activities include uh, planning work, acquisition and disposal of property, affordable housing, and community policing. Um, you know, so those, those, would, those would constitute redevelopment type of activities, you know, affordable housing and community policing being the, some of the you know, one not, not as obvious, right, to, to, to people when they think about redevelopment. Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the law requires that C community redevelopment agencies adopt a redevelopment plan. A copy of the original and only redevelopment plan for, for the Cape Canaveral CRA was given to you prior to the meeting. And the redevelopment plan serves as like the Bible, the roadmap, the guidelines for the C CRA to conduct its community redevelopment activities and its, and its related activities. If, so while I explained geographical area limits the CRA's authority, well, so does the redevelopment plan. If it's not in the redevelopment plan as, as, an act, as a defined activity, then the CRA can't, can't act. It needs to modify the plan uh, consistent with state law. So, CRA activities has to be within a certain geographical area, and what the CRA wants to do has to be in the plan. Always keep those two points in mind, because um, it'll be related to any advice in, that you give to the, to the CRA. So now, all this is great, the redevelopment, you know, the redevelopment objectives, removing slum and blight, but as I mentioned, the, another primary purpose is preservation or enhancement of the tax base. That is extremely important, not only for the city, but for the CRA, because enhancing the tax base is the way that the CRA actually generates revenue to do redevelopment activities. And they, they have this, this provision in the law that um, you know, the CRAs have to create a redevelopment trust fund so they can take their money in and it has to be um, segregated from the rest of the city's funds. So in this trust fund, revenue annually gets deposited and it, um, on, a, on a principle called tax increment financing. That's a fancy way of saying that they get the, the CRA, when it was created in 2012, we all took a snapshot of the overall property um, assessed value in this geographical area, the CRA area. And that's called the base year. So the base year, let's say the base year, the total property assessed value in the, in the CRA area was $100. The CRA will then, in the future, starting from the base year, get um, the, the revenue, of the, 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 the Avalorum tax revenue from the assessed value in the geographical area for the current fiscal year over the base year. So if the, if the, if the values go up to $300, the CRA's revenue is based on $200 of assessed value. So that incremental increase above the base year, year over year over year, as the assessed value in the CRA grows, so do the revenues. And Cape Canaveral 
has had a lot of success. And I, I represent other CRAs. The, it's amazing how much the assessed value of property in the CRA district has gone up since 2012. So this CRA actually has a, and Dave's gonna talk about it, has annual revenues of approximately $2.8 million uh, in this coming fiscal year compared to some other CRA clients of mine that have been in existence since the 80, that 80s that only generate about $1.4 million a year because their assessed value in their CRA area has not grown as expeditiously as Cape Canaveral's. And you know, the hotels obviously play an important role in that. Um, We'll have a. The ba um, oh, the base. If, revenue if you hold that thought, was, was zero for the CRA because they hadn't. I mean, the first yeah. year. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, the, fir yeah. the first year was maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand, yeah. maybe. Yeah, like yeah. That. we'll, we'll, we'll have a. We'll, we'll have you a barn raft here that. shortly. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Is is that funds? So now, if you go back up to my slide where you look at the primary purpose, you can kind of see. Um, how, how those two primary purpose of a CRA are related, right? Preventing and eliminating slum and blight enhances property values. Uh, redevelopment activities in the CRA potentially increases assessed value. Um, those all work um, in conjunction with preserving and enhancing the tax base because if valuation goes down in the CRA area, so do tax revenues, right? So it's all about trying to eliminate the slum and blight and hopefully do redevelopment activities and, and, and increase that tax base. So next slide. So when you look at the, the Bible here, the, re, the existing redevelopment plan that was adopted in 2012 um, has certain components to it um, that lay out what the, um, the activities and objectives and that the CRA is going to pursue. The first one is related uh, to the bed board's initial um, responsibilities, and that is business and development assistance. So the plan lays out, a, and I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but it goes through ideas as to um, those types of things that the CRA can get behind and support and promote and expend its TIF monies uh, towards. Um, and there's a list there of uh, you know, some, some possibilities under the category of business and development assistance. Next slide. So yep. if I could ask you a question. Yes, so sir. I want to understand a couple of things before we get too much further. How was this boundary established? The, the boundary was established when the, when the CRA was created. The, the city had to do a finding of necessity. That finding of necessity, the city hired a consultant to examine the geographical area of the, the whole city and then come to a, an, an expert opinion and determination as to whether or not slum and blight existed within this geographical area. So the, the boundaries of the area is driven by the purpose. Determined by the purpose of Got removing it. slum and blight. So, so the finding of necessity was approved by the council and then it went to um, Brevard County, who ultimately had to have the final say on whether or not the city could create a CRA. And they supported that, you know, that geographical bond. Is that it up there, the, that line? That is it. Yep. You can see the black line, you know, going around the city that in that area, um, you know, the finding of necessity performed by the consultant said that, yeah, there's slum and blight that exists. Now, slum and blight, the definition of slum and blight, just, just so it doesn't scare everybody, it, it's sometimes bro it's broader than you know, dilapidated buildings, right? It could be lack of adequate levels of governmental services. It could be traffic problems. It could, you know, that could be considered slum and blight. It could be a plethora of vacant properties, right? It could be slum and blight. And, you know, you could have, you can have the Taj Mahal, you know, in the middle of an area that's surrounded by slum and blight, but the Taj Mahal gets included in the geographical boundaries, right? because it's, it's kind of in the middle. So there might be some of that, like if you pinpointed specific properties within the geographical area, and you're like, that's not slum and blight, but it's surrounded by slum and blight. Um, so, so is this operational definition of slum and blight 
documented somewhere. So, mm -hmm. oh okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, we you don't have those documents. I mean, in 2012, 20, actually the findings of necessity was probably done in 2010, 2011. If you really like to do reading, the city could certainly dig that document up, and you can see the findings that were made on slum and blight to create that boundary that you see up on the map. Yeah. And, no, and what if things have changed since the boundary was originally drawn? The boundaries have not changed since. They no. Were what if things about slum and blight have changed? So an area that's outside of the current boundary now becomes one that would today be operationally defined the same way as it was in 2012. Areas outside of that boundary. Yeah. If they were slum and blight. Yeah. Then they are. They remain outside the boundaries. They would have to be a. Um, a change of the geographical boundaries, which would require um, another finding of necessity, um, approval by the city council, and then presentment to the county commission. Got it. And yes. then all these public notices have to go out because it affects the designation of a CRA affects other taxing authorities, not just the city. Sure. Right. So when I mentioned that TIF revenue, that you know, as it goes up, um, while it's good for the CRA. That, that TIF revenue that the CRA gets deposited in its trust fund comes from the city's general fund and from the county's general fund predominantly. Got it. Okay, because when the county approves these CRAs, they're agreeing that a portion of their, their ad valorem taxes generated after the base year will go to the CRA so the city can do this, uh, the CRA can do this redevelopment activity. So there is a partnership with the county regarding CRA activities as well. And they've provided a lot of oversight in the last five years on CRA boards. You may have read a lot of newspaper articles about it. So they're generally out of favor. Yeah. Obviously you know. you're put taking money out of one hand and putting it into the other. Mm -hmm. The first being the, the county's general fund. I think there's over 20 CRAs in, uh, in Brevard County right now. Uh, I think it's in excess of last I saw was like eight million dollars a year. It's probably up to ten or twelve million dollars a year now that mm -hmm. doesn't go to the county general fund. Uh, thanks. Yeah, we don't. I don't. We don't need to get too deep into the politics tonight about CRAs, but there there has been some pushback at the county level, and they and they wield some authority over the city CRA. Frankly, um, that uh, they've 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 certainly have a, a narrower view of what CRAs can be used for um, than, than perhaps what's even in within our CRA plan. So that, that's kind of some background, I'll call it background noise that we, that you, you know, we always have to keep in mind as we're, as we're developing budget, CRA budgets. But, um, but anyways, I didn't really get too deep into that tonight because that's a whole other thing. But uh, um, keep in but, mind too that, you know, that, that the CRA has a it has a finite life, so yeah. this CRA expires in about 2040? 14 years or so. Yeah, seventeen. So well, you know, the, the while the county may be contributing to, you know, they are they are benefiting, right? It's their residents, their commercial property owners, and eventually the CRA goes away, and then you know the county does not doesn't have to share a portion of the avalon taxes. Uh, that's generated from the CRA boundaries to the CRA anymore. So um, there's, there's a lot of benefits to the county from, from doing this, in my opinion, but not everybody on the county side shares that. <laughs> um, so moving on, I mean, to the redevelopment plan. These are, those are good questions, by the way. Yeah. Um, the, the CRA plan specifically lists catalyst projects as a category, looking for those, you know, public private partnerships to, to engage in redevelopment activities if they materialize, things like land assembly, site preparation, public facility and infrastructure improvements, grants. I mean, those, those, those nuts and bolt redevelopment activities for development projects is clearly laid out in the redevelopment plan. You know, pub, other public facilities like parking facilities, uh, shared stormwater retention, property acquisition, there's even mention of a town center project maybe sometime in the future that the CRA could participate in. Next slide. Another category um, is your nuts and bolts, public improvements to provide uh, necessary public facilities. The CRA plan clearly lays out 
this as an authorized expense and an authorized endeavor, doing utility improvements, for example, um, the CRA participated in a joint project with the city to um, redo and regionalize lift station on the east side of A1A that so far has resulted in serving at least two or three new hotels on the on the east side of A1A, but you know, but for that regional lift station, there would not have been capacity um, for those for those new hotels. So that's an example um, where the CRA stepped in to help with utilities uh, to support its primary purpose of removing slum and blight and enhancing the city's the, the tax base. Right. So it's again, an interesting side note um, that Don Mays's father-in-law and his company helped along with that to grant several easements for that supersized lift station to go further north to the undeveloped parcels. When this happened, it was before the brewery was at the brewery. And if you remember, it was just a, a vacant building for a long time, and the lift station is right there next to the brewery. And there was nothing else north of that except for Purcell's carpet. So through the grantings of these easements, through Don and her, her father-in-law's company, it made the path available to, to have those developments happen. So. I want to thank Dawn for that. And I forgot about it. Yeah, that's right, that connection. <laughs> she, pipes she, are important. Lift stations are important, but so are water pipes. Water and sewer. Water and, and, and sewer. And you've got to put the pipes somewhere. So, yeah, that's right. You're and she did it for sewer did. impact fees, not cash, mm -hmm. which is still haven't paid off for you. I'm sorry about that. But thank you. <laughs> it was a worthwhile investment for the city. <laughs> so, I mean, so you can see a list of, you know, public public improvements. Uh, you know, that's a that's a nut and bolt endeavor for, for CRAs. Um, another in red is the planning studies related to redevelopment initiatives. That's a, another uh, thing that's laid out in the redevelopment plan. I think the CRA has funded some of the study for the presidential streets, Todd, I think, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that would be an example of planning yeah. study? Yeah, and the presidential streets is a long project, what Dave will, might get into, but we expect CRA funding will also pay for the lion's share of that too over the life of the CRA. So um, that's tying a you know, real life project to the text that you read in the redevelopment plan. Next slide. Um, this one I would put an asterisk next to, marketing special events and administration. Um, things like branding and marketing, business recruitment, special events. Um, I wouldn't put the CRA next to CRA staff administration, but um, and, 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 the, and the redevelopment plan updates. But um, these certain types of soft costs um, are not um, not looked upon very favorably, and you know, there's some authority that some of these soft costs, like you know, marketing and things like that are not eligible CRA expenses. A plan that was adopted in 2012 does mention, mention those, but, you know, that's something that the county doesn't like to see. Um, it's, it's, it's too intangible um, uh, relative to redevelopment. So I, that's why I say put an asterisk next to it. Um, the plan also lays out in a local agreements in a local agreements is just a you know a government term for describing an agreement between government entities um, we have a couple of those interlocal agreements related to the CRA's uh, responsibilities we have an interlocal agreement with the county that was was adopted a couple of years ago that um, imposes some restrictions on the CRA also, you know, defines the definitive term of the CRA, which will expire in September, maybe 14 years from now. Uh, we have interlocal agreements between the CRA and the city regarding the funding of um, public projects. Yeah, and I want to mention that that's, that's how you, how CRAs typically leverage um, financing for, for the, the benefit of the area. You've got this revenue stream that you can pledge towards this debt if you want to take on this debt and and we've done that in a couple cases um, generally we we do it through and in a local with this with the city and the city takes on the debt but the CRA agrees to pay the uh, principal and interest on that debt over over that period of time so it's a revenue stream that can be multiplied like that to get something big done now 
and we've been taken successful advantage of that. Um, the next uh, item mentioned in the plan is uh, community policing innovation activities. Uh, we don't currently um, provide any funding, I don't believe, for that. Um, some CRAs have. I mean, if you've ever been to Coco Village, Co Coco Village has um, turned into quite the nightlife um, area um, in the last couple of years. There, the, the city of Coco's downtown CRA does provide uh, some uh, police funding for community policing activities of law enforcement during certain nights to um, provide additional law enforcement services. To um, so that's an eligible expense, and I know Coco does it. Cape Canaveral doesn't currently. Also, uh, development of short and long-term project schedules is kind of a nebulous, like, little scheduling item. I mean, if we ever had to do something like that, the CRA would be able to participate. So, um, so, any, so I just covered, like, the highlight of the general categories. One thing I didn't cover um, is affordable housing. Affordable housing is also um, an eligible CRA activity. This current CRA plan does mention it. Um, the Florida legislature this past session adopted a huge affordable housing initiative. Some of that includes um, preempted zoning, um, but also a um, significant amount of funding trying to promote uh, more affordable housing um, in the state of Florida. The county has um, promoted last, I think last year, they wanted to see more CRA initiatives related to affordable housing. Um, so that is authorized type of uh, activity in the redevelopment plan, authorized by law, and the public policy of the state um, and the county are, are all behind trying to uh, increase affordable housing in the state. So that, that covers a very, very high level, the plan. So, I mean, I think the presentation so far is kind of giving you a very high level, which hopefully try, you know, when you, when you start delving into all this stuff, this stuff will make sense. Um, the, other, the other few items I wanted to cover just very, very quickly, and um, don't do this to, you know, scare people, but I need to cover it, the next slide. Um, as, a, as, a, as a board um, that's been appointed by the city, I just want to remind the board that the government and the sunshine, the sunshine law does apply to this board. All meetings of this board must be conducted in public. Um, any communications between two members of this board um, that um, are related to something that is coming before the board or reasonably could come before the board um, need to take place at an open public meeting like this. You shouldn't have private conversations with other board members regarding the board's, um, you know, responsibilities. Um, you know, for these meetings, the city will provide, has to provide reasonable notice out there. Um, minutes have to be taken. So, you know, as you get um, farther along when every meeting that you have, you should have a set of draft minutes that you're gonna to have to review and, and approve by law. Um, so, you know, I would just advise, you know, don't have any private discussions with one another regarding your roles and responsibilities. Make sure that your discussions occur at an open public meeting of this board and then everything will be fine. Just uh, a clarification on that. If we have questions about a matter that's coming before the board, it is, my understanding that we, one of the best conversations to have is with staff about a particular issue if you want to dig into it or sound something out. Is that a correct statement, Anthony? That is, that is correct. Because the okay. Sunshine Law only applies to the seven of you talking to one another. Doesn't, doesn't apply to you talking to a staff member. So, yeah, certainly free to get as much information and talk to staff as much as you want. So, next slide. Excuse me? What's that? I said it's a double-edged sword, that yep. sunshine law, yep. mm -hmm. my opinion. It is, uh, it's a, yeah. Provides and transparency and also hamstrings pro progress sometimes. Sure does. 
So, so that's uh, mayor. Good evening, mayor. Hello, mayor is nice in the view. mayor is in the house. Nice view from up here. Mayor is in the house. <laughs> So um, just keep in mind that you know the Sunshine Law also applies to email communications, right? So it's not just face-to-face -face personal meetings or telephone calls. It means emails too. So you know you shouldn't be emailing one another about board business, right? <clears throat> um, next slide, please. And that those are just the penalties. Um, worst case scenario. Next slide. Um, also keep in mind public records law does apply to this board. Um, anything that you send, receive related to the board business, um, yeah, we're going to be deemed a public record um, and they need to be preserved and open for public inspection. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, you do put something in writing related to board business, it, you know, it's going to be deemed a public record and, you know, if somebody wants to... Uh, wants to review it, makes a public records request, you know, it will be provided for them to see. So, you know, be on your best behavior on the emails. Next slide. Um, there is a code of ethics under Florida law. I won't delve too much into this, but it, as, a, as, a, as a board member appointed by the council, you are technically a public officer with respect to your, your duties on the bed board. And yeah, the, the basic things, you know, apply. You know, you can't solicit and accept gifts, you know, for purposes of influencing, you know, whatever advice or you may be providing the city. Um, you know, you can't, you can't do business with the city that results in the conflict of interest. You, you know, you can't uh, use this board to secure special privileges or misuse privileged information. I mean, just, you know, common sense things, um, you know, that I'm sure you all, you know, are used to uh, conducting yourself. Apply. Next slide. Wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the part about you have to disclose clients that you represent? Back back up. Where, where are you? Wait. Second to the last. Um, it says second to the last thing, it, clients represented. Um, there is, yeah, there is a, um, there is a provision. Um, I think it's pr probably easier to explain if I give you, give you an example. If um, there was a possibility that there was a, um, uh, the city CRA uh, was going to consider giving a grant to a, um, a developer. Okay. And you were uh, the attorney for the developer. Okay. Okay. That's going. To, I mean, you, your instincts and your familiarity with the bar rules, the red flags are going to start going up, right? So you're going to have to you're going to have to disclose that. You know, you won't be able to vote on any advice that you would be providing the city. Um, you know, and then there's some more complicated rules regarding um, receiving certain contributions or honoraria for for speaking engagements that. They're not really going to apply here. So that answer hopefully gave you. Yeah, a... and any of these violations are just a misdemeanor. They're not felonies. Uh, yes. Okay. And no. No. <laughs> yes and no. Okay. Because they're. I mean, they're, we're just. I mean, it, it, the the law is a mosaic, right? So these are just the ethics laws that uh, okay. Florida has adopted, right? All right. At certain violations could be violations of other laws that right. could be applicable, right? right. So yeah. Kenny, I don't even want to speculate on that kind of stuff. Um, next slide. Voting conflicts. Um, it, I gave you one example of a voting conflict. You know, if you have a if you have a client that's going to be eligible for a, a CRA grant and you have to give advice on that grant grant as a potential grant as a board and you have an interest in that uh, entity or person that's going to receive the grant, I mean, it could present a financial interest to you or certain other covered individuals, which would result in you having to declare voting conflict of interest. On the Florida law, you know, these, 
city committees, city councils, the rule is you're required to vote unless you have a voting conflict. That's why when you wanted to abstain on the voting for your chairperson position, I told them, well, you can vote on it. It's because you know, that's not technically a voting conflict under the law. So you can vote. In fact, the law requires you to vote whether you like it or not. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, any private gain or loss related to any of the any of the board's business, um, and that not that includes not not only your CRA act activities. You know, we got the broad umbrella of the in historical role and responsibility of the bed board right on business and economic development. So just keep that in mind. You may over you know because you all are business people. You may have some business interests that kind of uh, collide with the city and the city CRA that you might in some cases have to um, declare a, a voting conflict on, on, on your responsibilities. So next slide. And um, that's it. Do you have any question? That's a real high level summary. There were a couple of pictures in there. Uh, see, we got a hotel in there. That's I think I think that's the one of them that yeah. was a beneficiary of that regional lift station that yeah. the CRA participated in. Yeah, yeah, that looks like Homewood Homewood Springs. Yeah. Homewood yeah. Suites, first one, one of the first. Yeah, ones. we got a, a a wish list, you know, trying to improve A one A. It seems to be a never ending discussion. We got. Yeah, some nice new, uh, you know, public facilities. Multi, yeah, I'm not sure if multi-gen is multi-gen yep. in the CRA. Yep, yep. City and funded Hall by the CRA. Within the CRA area, um, the um, Cape Center is in the CRA. Um, all three of those buildings have been constructed um, since the CRA was created, and I think the CRA has participated in all three, right? Yeah, and that's the way I used to explain it. That. Um, if you had a son or a daughter, let's say, that wanted to buy a house and they only qualified for $100,000, but they wanted a $200,000 house, and you said to your son or daughter, well, you know, son, if you go to the county, they have this program, well, they'll match you. You put in your $100,000, they'll give you $100,000. <clears> wouldn't you authorize, wouldn't you tell your son or your daughter to go do that, and they could get the house that they want? That's what the CRA is, essentially. It's half of it's the county money, half of it's the city money that's paying for that facility. CRA and the city have had quite a few public, you can see it on the screen, public private, public, public, public prop, uh, partnerships um, mm -hmm. working together. And then you know, we got another little picture up there of, I think, a, a possibility for the aquarium, right? That might be, uh, it's outside of the city, um, but it's a, it's a possible, uh, you know, big project right on the border of the CRA. Certainly have some effects on the CRA. Yeah, we'll have some impact. For All sure. right. Is that everything, yeah. Anthony? That's um, mine. You I'm going to try to move things along pretty quickly. How, how much that assessed value has increased over the years? Yeah, let's let's get into some interest. I'm not, I shouldn't say that. Your stuff was very interesting. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, does anybody want to leave? Yeah. <laughs> uh, after, after hearing that, uh, are you sure you still want to be on this board? I've heard it before, and I'm still fascinated, Dave. <laughs> yeah. You want a five-minute break? Yeah, just a couple matches. Though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chairman, one of your members is asking for a quick break. Um, we'll uh, a break? Yeah. Entertain a motion for a five-minute break. So moved. All in favor? Uh, four. Hi. Yeah. Five-minute break. You got a gavel? I don't have the gavel. Oh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ron's the gavel. The gavel man. You can be my gavel guy. You want to be the gavel guy? <laughs> <laughs> Let's my water out of the car real quick.
Where's AJ? I'll give it to give it to Tom. Because he needs a corner guy. So we need a garage. There, there you go. Thought it was. I'm gonna give it to you, Tom. Oh, I'm gonna make you the gavel guy. <laughs> Fort St. John's is a very nice place to live. And I have to really think about my Robert's oh, rules right. too. I think that's gonna be oh. an explosive area. You know this? Yeah. This right here? Yeah. Oh. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. I'd like to call us back to order, please. <laughs> And I think we need to note that we had a member leave at the break. I was only kidding when I said if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he took you seriously. I think he did this. Ron said he had to go back and close the okay. close the store. Well, so, business first. Yeah. Business first. Yes, ma'am. Uh, reconvening the meeting of the bed board. Time is 7.02. Right. And I believe the presentation is now yours, Mr. David. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I will move through this very quickly. I, I, I really like to run a, I'd love to have hour long meetings if we can possibly do it. So I know that might not be possible this evening. We had a lot of, a lot of ground to cover, but uh, that's, that, that's always my goal. Um, so I'm gonna make, just make a few comments on the CRA and then we'll, I'll make a few comments on the Economic Development Action Plan and maybe we'll talk about a little bit of homework and we can wrap it up. Um, on the screen in front of you, we have a uh, CRA and, and the next few screens are taken right out of our CRA annual report. That is one of the statutory requirements of CRAs is to have, a, um, have an annual report. All of this information that we're gonna be talking about here shortly is all on our city CRA webpage. So if you'd like to get in and dig around in the CRA, we have a dedicated, as required by, by law, we have a dedicated CRA page, web page. Um, so what I wanted to do with this, accomplish with this page is just give you a little idea of who the staff is um, and, and, who, and, and who the uh, board members are. Staff is generally Todd. Todd is what is known as the CRA agent. Um, as well as being a city manager, he puts a different hat on, um, kind of like the city council does when they're, when they're sitting in their CRA role. Todd has a different hat he puts on. Um, Mia Goforth is our, typically our city clerk, but in her CRA responsibility, she is the CRA recording secretary. And then myself as the um, CRA director, and I have other city responsibilities, as I indicated earlier. So those three individuals, as long, along with Anthony, are going to be the, the bulk of the staff that, that handles CRA matters. Um, John DeLeo, our finance director, is very involved in preparing CRA budgets every year. So there's a few other folks that are involved. But these, these are the folks that you'll primarily, the faces and the names you'll primarily see. Now, as we've mentioned several times, uh, so we don't need to go into this, the city council uh, has basically um, appointed themselves as the CRA board, um, executive board, um, and that is done on a very regular basis. Other communities, in my experience, much larger communities will actually um, have um, residents, lay people serve on their, as their CRA board, um, but in, in Cape Canaveral situation, city council has a second hat. Next, please. Okay, here's the map that we talked about, and this is the map that you, we have over here on the um, easel. But you can see, I think this, this map really jumps out at me because you can see the CRA is the darker area. You can see what a significant portion of the city has actually been designated as a CRA. It's actually, 50, I think it's 56 or 57 percent, Todd? 56 percent. Uh, That's a significant area of any city to be designated as a CRA. Most of them are pretty compact and focused. Um, and that may be one of the reasons, as we'll talk about here shortly, why we've been so financially successful. Um, next slide, please. Okay, interesting information on these two charts, graphs. You can see, as Anthony was, on the, and the one on the left with the bar graph, you can see back in 2012 was our base year, what we were talking about. And you can see the CRA's valuation was 230 million. The last year, in 2022, it was 572 million. So that's, that, that's the entire built environment in the CRA map, all the buildings and structures and values in there aggregated are the 230 or 250 in the base year. Yes, yes. 
So that just gives you a, a, a kind of an idea of what's been going on in our CRA. And because we continue that, we're going to have additional hotels coming in, coming online. When I say online, I mean coming onto the tax rolls. These numbers are going to con continue to get better and better and better. So when, um, the, so the, when the TIF tax increment financing is determined, you're taking three hundred and forty-two million dollars. Yeah, the difference. The difference. Yeah. And t calculating the ad valorem taxes on three hundred and forty million, and the CRA gets a share of the city's um, ad valorem taxes and a share of the county's. Yeah. Ad valorem taxes on three hundred and forty million dollars. That'll continue to grow through twenty forty. Yeah. I don't want to get too into the weeds. Yeah. It's, it, we've been very 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 excited. I don't want to get too into the weeds, but if you look at the base year at two was it two thirty? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 230. 230. 230. What happens is the county will continue the city general fund where those monies went, were deposited, those ad, ad valorem revenues went into the city general fund and they went into the county, county ad valorem. They, the county got its share. When we, when, we capped, when we set that base year, anything above that, that, that money that would have otherwise gone to the county is now staying in the city. That's the money, that's, that's a big chunk. And if you look in the graph next, the, the table next to you, look at the green bar graph on, or the green section. That shows you what this, this coming year's budget is. You can see that, that the, city, the city portion of the revenue is 1.4. The county is paying 1.2. So we've got about $2.6 million coming into our CRA right now. Why did um, they differentiate in the projected year and not in the historical years? I'm sorry, what was that, Tom? You've got one four and one two in the projected budget year, and last year they were the same. The year before they were the same. You the know county why? They made a, a we, change that they could never exceed the city's portion, but they could be less than. Mm. That was one of the, th remember a few years ago when the county put the squeeze on the, some of the CRAs? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they required us to enter into interlocals. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the provisions of the interlocal was they capped, they, I'm going to say they capped their, their uh, contributions to the city CRAs. I think in that first year there, was it 2010? No, it was no. What is it? Can't so if the city's millage goes down. The portion was more. Um, and then they enacted that and we actually had to refund them the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can I ask another question? Why... Uh, the transfer from the general fund, which is this fifth line, is that to plug the hole on expenditures? 150,000. My, my recollection, Dave, was that was the uh, West Central Streetscape project. Yes. The cost overruns on that. Yes. I believe that's the case. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, yeah, you're plugging the hole. That's the, yep, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, I just like to quickly run through the rest of those lines. I have another question. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Was there I a, had I'm a, sorry. a quick question. Yes. Uh, again, I'm trying to, you said this is the num this valuation is the sum of the property values in the CRA. Do we have any idea what the breakdown is from like CRA investment versus just property values increasing over time? So increase in value based on new building permits. You can find that on the property appraiser's website. She actually breaks that out. But Yeah, I, I, we don't track that number, but, um, but it, we could. Um, and that's, that's something, let's kind of put a pin in that. Let's talk a little bit about that because this is part of your homework. There, there's, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we move forward and, and, okay. and, and, and what we keep our eye on. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Now the operating is strictly just again we don't we don't pay any staffing it's strict it's pretty it's pretty bare bones uh, operation um, so we've got a we've got a little bit of operating uh, fees um, we've got city attorney uh, we've got some travel and per diem just some basic stuff um, capital outlay this is where we this is where this is how we spend our CRA dollars um, and you can see the types of projects over in the description column towards the left part of the, of the, of the table. Um, and we generally try, we, we've historically generally tried to spend our CRA dollars on what I call hard costs, hard projects, lift stations, um, community buildings, streetscapes, um, civic hubs, 
brick and mortar projects. We've really tried to steer away from what I think Anthony referred to as soft costs, like marketing and parades and that kind of stuff. So, so um, that's 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 been our that's been our approach historically. Real um, quick, Dave, before you go any further, sorry. Um, oh. Back in the operating costs, there's a large difference on the professional services over previous years. Is there a special project that that's attached to? 152,000 in professional services. Yeah, I believe what's gonna happen in this coming year is, I believe it was either Anthony or Todd mentioned the Presidential Streets Master Plan. Mm -hmm. That is a, we could talk, of, that's a whole other meeting. Um, but what we've done is we've, we've carved out a portion of the city, mostly the Presidential Streets between A1A and Ridgewood. And we've identified that area as a, um, let's just say it's getting a little tired mm -hmm. and it needs some reinvestment, um, both above ground and below grade, um, as far as the infrastructure, water, sewer, sidewalks, all of that. Um, so we have initially looked at paying for a lot of that with CRA funds. And so what that 152 is, is Next year will be the first year that we're gonna, we're gonna actually go out and start doing some um, hard engineering and design work for purposes of the master plan. Okay. So, and then subsequent years, you're gonna see that number growing quite large as we actually start going out and actually start building. And, and, and that and went through city council, I assume, and approved through city council. Uh, yeah. through the CRA through, board. Through the CRA, from I, CRA board, sorry, got it, okay. I, su I suspect the CRA board will be asking for this board's input on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that that is a multi-year project. Um, obviously, when you, you guys, some of you, you know, know how much a, uh, a half a mile of uh, new water and sewer lines and sidewalks and, and street trees and one, you know, and it, it, putting new roads in, it can get very expensive quickly. So we could, there's going to be a lot of money um, spent on the mass, on implementing the, the, the Presidential Streets project. So that number will be growing significantly in the next in the next subsequent years. Is there a slide that shows ex historical expenditures like beyond this scope? No, not tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. If that's something that the board would like, we can certainly no. certainly Is it on the is it on the database on the website? We can we can produce that and we'll just um, if Renee if you'll note that for the next meeting we'll produce the no, historical series expenditures. Curious. Yeah. So I noticed in this document, you know, you're this was the last one. It looks like you plugged the hole with general funds. Uh, is there a cash balance this year? Or it always has much to be um, obligated. You can't just have a cash balance. That's a requirement of CRA okay. 101. Um, so you have to obligate it to future projects. If you don't, you have to return it to the uh, cool. uh, taxing authority. We're not going to have any. So not it's a use have it or lose it plan. Use so it, it or lose it. Yeah, yeah we don't want that. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and then debt service is, uh, as, as one of the speakers mentioned earlier, I think we have three outstanding notes um, that are being paid down by the CRA. Um, one of them is going to be t uh, paid off here in a few years, and then I think a couple of years after for the, next, for the other two. So. What's the outstanding balance between the three? Oh, I want to oh. say around... I want to say around two and a half million, but I don't know. It's more than that, is it? Um, because the community center and the Cape Center were one, on one, and that was I think eight million, eight point five million, uh, and that was a couple years ago. Plus, we did the one point nine million to purchase the building next door, took that down. So it's 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 up there still. We're only um, three three four years into the eight point five, and I think we're two years into the one point nine. Both of them are, are ten year notes, short term. Uh, the financing was around 2.1 percent. Love it. So we're paying it back in cheaper dollars than we got it. You're making yeah. money on that. Yeah. The last loan I think was 1.69 or something. It was just crazy. We'll have this building paid off in a next year. Yeah. <laughs> in the historical data, I would also like to see just what's already allocated to the that debt service, just so we have an understanding of the workings that are already sure. the projects that are already on the table, so to speak. Sure, so we'll just do a uh, current report of CRA projects and accounting um, where we are with uh, debt and, and also length of term remaining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right, so that's debt service, and then, um, and then we have a contingency fund. So um, if there's no more questions on this, next slide. Okay, I think this is my final slide, and this is just, this is, these two pages were taken out of our annual report. Uh, I believe I, you have a copy of our latest one on the dais. Um, and these are, this is just a general um, report on what projects, private projects, happened in the, um, within the boundaries of the CRA. We also have a corresponding report that shows the public projects that happened. Um, how we spent. So this is more of how the funds came in, bigger projects. Doesn't, doesn't account for 100% of the revenue, but bigger projects. And then we have a, another portion of the report that shows how we spent the money. So the difference is that these projects, we, we would say, were inspired by the CRA as opposed to the public projects which were paid for by the CRA. Yeah, benefited from, yes. Um, and you can see, I mean, you can see the number of hotels on these, on, at least in these two years. They, they certainly helped the, uh, the city's CRA. Next slide, please. Okay, let's briefly talk about the Economic Development Action Plan. Uh, I believe you did receive a copy of that as well. Um, it's, a, it's a lengthy, it's, I think it's 62, 63 pages. Um, and these are just gonna be some general statements. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so in 2010, the City Council uh, what did we, what, accepted this plan um, which had been prepared by a local consultant. And in general, um, the, the Economic Development Action Plan took into consideration a number of other initiatives that the city had undertaken the previous several years. It was kind of an amalgamation. And it, it, it really landed on three, I'll call them global high altitude goals. And that was to provide necessary steps to establish foundational requirements for a successful economic development program, recommend initial program opportunities, including business sectors with the greatest near-term opportunities, and propose a 2010 work plan for implementation. The plan then went and um, said, okay, this is, our, this, is our, this is our goal, to improve the livability and economic vitality of Cape Canaveral through smart development to enhance the attractiveness of the community for residents, businesses, and visitors, while preserving its unique natural coastal settings. Kind of sounds a little bit like the city's uh, vision statement almost. Um, then it was broken down into four strategies, and they were improve business climate, competitiveness, and capacity, retain and grow existing businesses, attract new businesses, residents, and visitors, and develop an image consistent with the city's vision statement. Next slide, please. Okay, can you pull up that third, um, third PowerPoint for me, please, the actual plan? I won't, I, I will not go page by, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of it. I'm just gonna just hit a couple highlights. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, let's go, can we sc scroll through those, Nate, Renee, please? Thank you, keep going, okay, okay. Um, yeah, uh, you can see right here, um, this is the section of the report where we kind of, re again, revisit that overarching goal and the four strategies on this, on, on this section of the, of the report. Can you scroll a little bit further for me, Renee? A little bit more, okay, a little bit more, a little bit more, um, okay. Um, one more, please. One more. Okay, keep going. Okay, here we go. Actions. Each of those four strategies are accompanied by between five and six and seven at what are called actions. And those are kind of quantifiable, specific steps that the city should take to actually accomplish these, these, these goals. And um, the, the, the balance of the plan is what you're looking at here. It identifies specific actions to implement the various goals. Now, um, you know, I've been through this several times and I'll, I think we'll just kind of talk turkey here. This plan was adopted in 2010. Um, it's as long as I've been here, which is a little over 10 years now, 
Um, the plan has not um, been actively implemented and actively monitored um, for, for how it's being, you know, what accomplishments are occurring as far as implementing the plan. Um, you know, there's reasons for that. Um, there's been a lot of activities that, that have occurred, such as the implementation of the Economic Opportunity Overlay District. There's other initiatives that the city has undertaken that perhaps has, has um, assisted with, its, with the city's economic development actions and activities. So one of the things that I would like to, one of the homework items I would like the board to consider is the, um, um, is to think about this plan. I'd, li I'd like you to review it and to think about the plan and with, with two questions in mind. A, does the city, given, given what else is going on in the city, policy-wise, does the city need to have an economic development action plan? I'm not giving, an, I'm not giving a yes or a no. I think that would, be a, that would be something I would like to hear some feedback on. Is that important for the city? to have a, a guiding principle, a guiding policy document leading the city's economic development initiatives and, 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 and efforts. Now, if the answer is yes, that is important, we would like to update the plan, then I would like the board to think about what, what has changed in the city since 2010 when this document was adopted. It's been 13 years. How has the city changed? Have any of the priorities that are located and identified in the 2010 plan, have any of those priorities changed? What are our today's priorities? What should the city be looking at and thinking about as we are moving forward with our economic, economic development initiatives? So um, those, are, those, are, those are two big asks, I recognize that, and they're, they're, they're kind of hard to get your arms around. Um, and we can certainly talk about that again if, if, if the board would like it, uh, once you've had a chance to go through the plan. But, but that's really, those are kind of foundational questions. What, what do we, as a board, what do you, do you feel the economic development, the update of the economic de development plan is important and necessary? And if you do, how, what should we be looking at? What should our priorities be? What should we be, what should we have our eye on? Todd, did you want to add anything to yeah, that? I just want to add some historical context to this, this document. <clears throat> when it came into being, it was before we even had a business and economic development board. Um, it came into being, as Dave said, around um, the late 2000s. <coughs> um, the city was also engaging in a, its first ever visioning effort at that time to say, hey, what do we want to be when we grow up? Let's get it right. This document came from that same period of time, and what came soon after that was this idea that, hey, we should have a business and economic development board. So the board was created, and they, they reviewed this, um, this plan, and the board came up with um, a list of priorities for economic development at the time, which included, let's define what our, our market niche is, what's special about Cape Canaveral, how we should... Uh, market ourselves, but we need to be realistic about it. And um, what kind of businesses do we want to attract? Who, who do we want to say we are? What came out of that was a general understanding at that time was we wanted to be small footprint high tech, perhaps uh, corporate headquarters kind of a thing. The city of Cape Canaveral is known throughout the world, not because of the city, but the area of Cape Canaveral is an area of you know launch space tours and all that stuff. Everybody around the globe knows about Cape Canaveral. How can we capitalize the name of that, on, the, on that name? We figured you put it on the letterhead, that, that has some, some cash to it right there. Um, so also we recognize that our geographic area is gonna make it very difficult for site selectors to pick us for say, the things that people want. They've always wanted to have a grocery store. They've always wanted to have more restaurants. They wanted to have more you know, dining opportunities. They wanted to have um, uh, just a drugstore. But the reason we're not getting those, and like you could never attract a Darden here, is because the radial ring methodology that most site selectors use is generally a five mile or a 10 mile ring. And you get dolphins and starfish and manatee in that, and they're not gonna spend money there. So they look at any other dozens of other better opportunity sites and they pass over Cape Canaveral. 
they don't use the other methodology, which would be the, the drive, tra drive time trade analysis, where you look at the, the traffic throughput in an area. In the city of Cape Canaveral, we've got 30,000, we'll look back 30,000 trips a day. Back then, it was probably 35,000. Now, I don't know. If you get, if you get a, a company that's willing to look at that different methodology, they might be willing to locate some companies here. We recognize that the, you can't make them use those methodologies, so you, if, you, if you don't, if you can't make them do that, what do you end up with? Well, we end up with what we've always got, which is kind of a hodgepodge of mom and pops. And the problems with them is they come in underfunded and they leave underfunded um, because rents continue to go up and they don't have the, the depth usually to continue to, and they can't thrive in this, in this market. So that's part of the problems we hear. Um, realtors talk about you know, they can't keep people in there because especially in this inflationary time, they're underfunded. Mom and pops want to come here. They see opportunity, but they can't afford to stay here. So there's a struggle here. Um, obviously, the hotel business works really well because we've got our proximity to the, the number one cruise port in the world. We're going to continue to see those numbers go up. Um, in case you don't know about um, hotels, and people might ask you why, why so many hotels happen here, is because um, the easiest way for me to say it is um, the division of uh, the office of Space Coast Office of Tourism, they put on a report called the STR report. I know many of you are familiar with the STR report. And it does um, monthly um, metrics. So you put in there basically, generally, it's the average daily rate, the occupancy, and the revenue per available room. And you look at every market in Brevard County, city by city. So you've got 16 different jurisdictions, or however many report. And they also have other larger mar metro markets, Orlando, Miami, Tampa, Jacksonville. And Cape Canaveral has been outperforming most of them in, hands down for the last several years. Average daily rates, Tom, I think in the 180s right now, something like that. Um, and occupancies, yeah, they go up and down seasonally. Our occupancies are always high. Our cruise business is very well. So as long as those numbers are higher than the others in the markets, the site selectors for hotels are going to keep hitting Cape Canaveral, keep pinging it until that number comes down. Um, and, and wouldn't you do that too? I mean, just that's where the market demand is, so that we're going to continue to see some hotels. But we will reach a saturation point probably within the next five to ten years, where uh, unless the cruise continues to grow, uh, and those numbers will start coming down. And then where are we? Well, we're 93%, 94% built out as a city. We've got very little raw land left. <clears throat> we do have sewer to all of it soon. Uh, there's a project coming up that's going to extend the lift station six easements even further. So the last parcels north of um, Purcell will be developed. I mean, they'll have it available right there. How do we want to see the rest of that develop? That's something that the bed board used to deal with. So they came up with this list, and I said this industry mix of things that they wanted to have. That This board can revisit all that documentation if you want. It may be a worthwhile cause. Um, <clears throat> then continuing in the history of this board, I know I went off on a tangent there. Um, the board kind of started slowing down because <clears throat> there was a dedicated staff person put to it, and it was me. Um, the city manager at that time, he made me community and economic development director. <clears throat> and then when Dave came on board, he, he bifurcated it and he said, Dave's community development and Todd's economic development. And I was able to handle um, almost anything that would come through to the city uh, through, as economic development director. But I would go to the board for advice here and there, and, and they were just so pleased with what was going on that we were doing everything we could do. They felt there wasn't a whole lot of need to meet. The only thing we were doing was potential AVT um, tax abatements, ad valorem tax abatements uh, applicants, because that was uh, required by our city code. And then we got one, and a few others didn't happen, and then that sunset. So the board really didn't have a need to meet, they felt, anymore, and there wasn't any great desire to, to waste anybody's time because there was nothing really going on. We had a full-time economic development professional staff ready to, to address these things. So the years go by, COVID goes by, and here we are looking at um, this council has changed, the economy has changed, we're in an inflationary period that we've never seen anything like this, I think, in, the, in my 22 years here with the city, and the council says, maybe we should re revigor reinvigorate this board. And I, I agree. I think it's a good idea. And um, I know, Stu, you had a lot to do with that and to make, it, make that happen. And I appreciate you really pushing that because I, I think we do need to look at updating this plan. We do need to, I think, look at 
updating how we position ourselves as a unique barrier island city with this strange um, history of you know eclectic one-off mom and pops and what can we do to help these businesses thrive and and continue also um, the traditions that we've developed in, in the city of Cape Canaveral as a uh, a beach tie, beachside town that's got a, a small town environment. You know, we, we, people know each other as neighbors here. We're threatened by some things like um, the, the decrease in homestead property ownership in the city of Cape Canaveral, largely because of the short term rentals. We know it's happening. But we still want to maintain that identity as a small town that um, embraces small town businesses, but also has such a strong economic core that we can do some very cool things. And we are doing cool things, especially in terms of resiliency and sustainability initiatives, like, like the Presidential Street Master Plan. That's just such a cool plan to be doing that. Um, so the CRA board then asked the Business and Economic Development Board to be a, a, a sounding board for some ideas. And I think that's a good idea too. So Anthony's given you this training here tonight. It'll help you if you have questions. Talk to Dave. Talk to me. You can always uh, we can get a hold of Andrew <coughs> too. There's a lot of potential things that this board can do, but there's also a wealth of information that this board created back when it was active, <clears throat> and I was here through all of it. So I'm happy to share any of that with you. So that's kind of like the canvas you're working with. <clears throat> I won't say it's a blank slate, but it, a lot of it is faded over time and it's and we can think about you know that was we're developing um, updates to the economic development action plan if that's what the board wants to do and maybe that plan needs to address how we market or how ourselves or maybe how we um, give business assistance and ha how do we interact with businesses are, <coughs> are we doing a proper job of interacting with businesses you know the just the, the ability to do surveys right now, survey monkey and getting get a hold of businesses and find out what businesses want. Maybe we should be doing that more outreach. And that's all on this board's purview to come up with those ideas about how you can help Cape Canaveral businesses. And then there's the larger business community, you know, you the Chamber of Commerce and you guys can act as uh, liaisons with the Chamber and other organizations, the EDC, for example, and be involved in those um, initiatives and bring them home to, to roost here with the city of Cape Canaveral. We wanna capitalize on all that. You folks were selected because not only you were interested, but because you have skills in this area. You're the, you're the talent pool that we're relying on to help us make these decisions in this area. And I know that's a lot, but that's kind of what I see the role of this board and all of that and things that I didn't even think of. There's a lot. <laughs> can I, uh, can I respond? Yeah, or please. Can I'll, I... I'll shut up, Tom. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> uh, I'll say this now and I'll elaborate it on it in future meetings. Uh, we got the background on the CRA. The city of Cape Canaveral and the previous commission did a phenomenal job. The magic sauce was you made it big. You covered 56% of the city. At the same time, we were down in Cocoa Beach and those opposed to development shot themselves in the foot because they kept arguing to make it small. It didn't even include the Western development at the International Palms, so they're generating no income. So kudos to the city for doing a great job by making it big. That's why the graph, you know, has more than doubled. You have the funding from the CRA grant that's going to continue for years to come. Economic development is a pretty broad term. You know, it's generally in the CRA, the curing blight and underinvestment, both from an infrastructural standpoint, a municipal standpoint, as well as a private standpoint. They go hand in hand. The city invests, then private enterprise comes in and invests after it. Economic development, you know, and money follows two things, path of least resistance and opportunities for highest return. That's why you have hotels in Cape Canaveral that have been built here and not in Cocoa Beach. Uh, because, and, and so that's the result of that. Uh, you and I have discussed this many times and while it's fun, you know, and maybe more of an academic exercise to sit around and contemplate what businesses we'd like to come here, I always kind of make the point that you're looking at a mosaic of individually privately owned land. So unless the city or the CRA is going to get into the process of developing property and putting buildings up for lease, uh, you can talk at length about what you might want here the tools that the city has is what it allows. You know, that's really, 
city's purpose, provide for public infrastructure, make sure everything's done right, and then go out and say, this is what we'll allow. And the city and the private market, depending on what the need is, will come back and, and, and find you and find this city or find any city. And what does private capital do? They follow the path of least resistance and look for the greatest return. So, you know, the primary tool that the city has and the reason you have hotels here is because primarily the density cap back in the visioning process, you allowed 65 feet and you effectively removed the density cap on an individual parcel for hotels. That was the mag sauce. Wow. And so if you want redevelopment under the umbrella of economic development and where there is still, I don't want to use the word blight, but under investment in the city of Cape Canaveral and the A1A core and some of these other vacant parcels, if you make it more flexible like you did with hotels, your private capital will figure that out. Having, you know, I recently reviewed the C1 and C2 permitted uses. And unlike, you know, your overlay district with respect, with respect to hotel densities, it's a very limited list. Let's say if you just take the counties, because I'm looking at a county project and you look at their general commercial general use, the permitted uses runs like six or seven pages. So if we want redevelopment, we should look at the development code and what's permitted and how to make it more flexible and private capital will then come in and, and find out, you know, you'll then find out because you're always going to be on the receiving end because the city's never going to be in the pro in the, <clears throat> in the business of actually developing. Thank you for the compliment. So, yeah. So, you know, so you still got residential density cap at 15. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you saw a multifamily development project being built in Cape Canaveral? hasn't happened you look around Brevard County here they're all over the place you know there are 100 units an acre in downtown Melbourne uh, you've got the Bank of America building in downtown Cocoa you've got all this other stuff that's at 30 to 40 to 50 units an acre private developers see that that one makes sense yep. path of least resistance I'm gonna you know invest 50 million dollars into apartments there you can just go to Vieira and see what's happening if you want redevelopment here and probably the most blighted section of town on A1A. And we got to figure out what to do with some of those lot dimensions. If private developers can buy residential properties and rebuild on A1A, you'll see redevelopment there. But without it, you won't. So, you know, I'll continue to sort of push this, but it really comes from a code perspective and incentive perspective. And I know you've struggled with that in, in our neighboring city. So we'll, we'll take the compliment. That means a lot coming for you. Thank you. The, what Tom referred to is the Economic Opportunity Overlay District. If, if you already know about this, I think uh, it's worth just a couple minutes to discuss what it is. The city adopted an overlay district, which is um, another map. You put a map down over an area and you say, okay, in this area, these are the codes that apply. And we did that. And it's Almost the same shape and size of the CRA. Do you have a map of the EOD? Deck? I yeah. think there's one over there if you look on the ground. It looks very similar to the CRA. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, we didn't great have to job. do a Good finding of necessity job. or anything because it's not a it's not a, gen, a, a increment generating tool. It's also in the documents you sent us. It is. You yep. got that. Okay. Thank you. And what it does is just allow these other codes and these other uses. Mm -hmm. And it gives us some wiggle room. It gives our council some authority for some very cool things through development agreements and plan, plan developments that would otherwise not be allowed. It, it was designed and intended for flexibility, but it also gave the one, one crucial thing was the ability to have higher heights than 45 feet. And the hotels we knew at the time were really struggling with that because you know, the old thinking was a condo could have 45 feet and get five stories in there. And you couldn't do that and get five stories in a hotel anymore because of the volume ceilings that are needed and the utilities and the different floors. And that flexibility to increase was allowed in the EOD, but there was a trigger mechanism and it required the community to, uh, appearance board to review for ar architecturally significant building, step backs, <clears throat> setbacks, building articulation, proportion, rhythm, landscaping enhancements, and so on. You could potentially get to 65 feet. Also, that code said that for beyond 65 feet, you could, you could potentially get it with city council approval through the PD, the plan design process. That hasn't happened yet. 
but that's the flexibility that the city of Cape Canaveral brought in and that Tom's referring to that allowed these more development friendly codes which also helped the hotels to come in. I think, the, didn't the overlay district do away with that five acre minimum for hotels they as did. well? Yep, there that is, was a big, there, that there's was always a big, been 150 room. big. There's always been 150 room minimum for hotels, right. but it also said you had to have five acres. So Why that the was, Radisson is on so much land. Well, so that was a de facto. We used, we used six and a half to build a residence in to meet that code. And yeah. then when you eliminated that, and now McKibben's looking at building on Don's property of what, 2.4? Yeah, so, so the, that you had a de facto um, density of 30 units per acre with 150 over five acres. Mm -hmm. And now with that acreage requirement gone, you yes. still have to have 150 units. However tightly you can pack it, that brings up your density numbers. But we didn't have any control on commercial density. Our only density controls were residential, as you mentioned before, and they're at 15 if, units per if acre. If you want residential development and affordability and affordable housing, you have to do something the city has to address the density cap because well, it, yeah. it isn't economically feasible there aren't parcels left in the city in order to do a financially feasible multi-unit development uh, 15 at 15 years. units an acre no, not at 15 units but, an acre. but dave sent me one today and i would say that came in somewhere under 15. it's a proposal concept plan i'm just south of atlantic gardens here it's not affordable housing. It, and, it, and it's not in the, it's not in the EOD, not in no. the CRA either. Right, right, right. But it's like, wow, there's a breath of fresh air. Somebody yeah. wants to build under density. Yeah, yeah, we don't see it. Uh, yeah. But it's not affordable housing. It's not. It can't no. be. No. 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 4,500 square I have, feet of I haven't even seen it, and I will bet you a million dollars it is not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there, there's a, good reasons for things that have happened the way that they have in the city of Cape Canaveral. It was, a, it was a mindset, it was a focus of the council at the time, 2008, 9, 10. They wanted to see some progressivity happen in the city. Um, you know, there's downsides that come with that too because, you know, with the CRA and leveraging debt, you're going to have debt. And, you know, the city hadn't had a history of debt prior to that. And you, you know, I look at it in terms of a pendulum swing, the, philosophically the, and theoretically, the city council um, prior to that did not want to have debt, wanted to just keep things small, keep things local, and what we got is good enough. Well, you, you end up living in the past with that kind of mentality. And most of you know as business people that you've got to continually reinvest in your assets if they're going to continue to re give you a return. Well, that, that's the council pendulum swung that way. So look, we need to do something. We got to become more progressive. They hired a new city manager and he came in and did so many wonderful things that started all that, all of this happening during that period of time. And um, he, he was here for 10 years, got a lot done. And, and then his time was up and now here we are now and we're looking at, okay, we got a lot of darn cool things accomplished for the city. And, uh, city assets, we've got city codes, we've got new business infrastructure development, we got CRA money. It's an interesting time for this board to come together and look at the lessons of the past, where we go from here, largely can be influenced by the decisions this body makes. And I do encourage you to look at the Economic Development Action Plan, spend some time as a homework document and say, yeah, we think, I hope you say, well, we think there's value here. We'd like to update it and maybe give us a path forward or thoughts on it. I'm not saying without professional help. We might need some professional help to do that, but uh, read through it and see what you think and give us our input, your input at the next meeting. Can we get a list of the existing businesses within sure. the zone? Because um, I mean, if, if you're a small rest, if you're a restaurant, then I guess your clientele is A1A, really, or Cape Canaveral. But if you're selling something, there's no reason that your clientele is just A1A in this world. Like I work with people that sell very well without even having a storefront. So if we wanted to keep our business, like our existing businesses, like and have the small town feel, we could like help foster them. That could be part of our plan. Yeah, so we can get you that list. Um, Renee, just, we'll just cross reference the uh, business tax receipt by address in the <laughs> CRA. We can come up with that list for yeah, you. I think we can. So that. The bed board and the business economic development plan isn't limited to CRA activity. No. Is it? No, it's just no. general 
recommendation. Yeah, okay. the, the, the scope of the bed board is the whole city. And the scope of the CRA is very narrowly defined within that. And, it, and, and also there's a larger component to this, which we touched on earlier. It's interesting to note the composition of this board is unique in that it's the only board in the city where members do not all have to be residents of the city. I think, how many of you are residents of the city, by the way? So three, three members of the city, but you're all local residents. So your, your experience is brought into bear here because you've probably got some investment in the city of Cape Canaveral, but also in the larger area, you know how things work in the larger area. It's a unique board, it's a cool board and you can do some cool things. Dave, you want to close it up? Wrap it up, yeah. I, I've got some, now's not the time to share, but I've got some really great ideas and thoughts on what the board could get involved in. I mean, there, there's some real, really neat projects that this board could get involved in. As, as Todd said, it's, it's a really interesting time for the city, and I think this board could have a significant impact on, on where the city goes and, and, and what its priorities are and how it spends its money. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very excited about it. So, um, so giving you a homework assignment, I think, I don't know, Madam Chairman, if you'd like to set up another meeting date now, or um, maybe if we could just get a, if you don't want to do that, if we could just get a sense of a time frame on when you would like to um, get back together again, um, that, would, that would be helpful. I'd love and, some feedback from the rest of the board on their thoughts. I'd love to set a date now. Right. Yeah, we but could. I like you travel a lot. I know. I think I'm going to be traveling in the next like month and a half, so I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, let's start here. Are Thursdays Thursday evenings good at six o'clock generally? So generally. if we wanted to set, just pick a frequency, do we want to go out every quarter, perhaps, or something more, something less? And we can just start looking at some dates. Like I coach a kids soccer team mm -hmm. on Thursday. I'm starting up again, but not after November, but I'm thinking you'd probably push yeah. it after November, right? Well, we're in August now. Um, probably, what does the board think about one more meeting before the end of this calendar year at some point? And then we can, at that meeting, we can set our um, calendar for the 2024 calendar year so that we all have it on our books appropriately going forward. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a, a healthy way to do it. Also, so because we, we have to give public notice, how much notice do we have to give on the meeting? Yeah, we generally try to give at least a week, so that's it's not okay. bad for this. We for okay. have a standard of getting a, an agenda out a week ahead of time. Right. Yeah. I just so, I didn't know if we had statutorily if we had any notices. Twenty four hour okay. notice. Just checking. You never know. So, um, but, but that puts us in November December time frame yeah. travel mm -hmm. schedules. It's hard to imagine, yeah. but December is going to be right around right. the corner, and that's typically not. A I was thinking month November. To, I was not going to yeah. even try for December. Okay. Um, so if we look <clears throat> at November, um, stand by one second, please. We're looking in November, probably that first full week, the week of the 6th, which would be November 9th. Does anybody have any conflicts with that date? And that would be, at that meeting, we will have had an opportunity to review the documents given to us by staff and also look at basically a goal of quarterly meeting um, and set those quarterly meetings for the 2024 calendar year. Sounds great. We, we would also, I don't know if we need to discuss this at that meeting, but for those that only were elected to a one-year term, do we yes. need to address that at that meeting? That's a, that's a great point. Thank you for raising that. Todd, yeah, I think there's actually one or two of the members actually term mm -hmm. out in no, this November. Yeah. Yeah, because they were finishing the terms of previous. Right. So we'll project. have to. So the way that it works is if, if there are other people interested in serving on the board and a current sitting member also wants to sit on the board, um, they, they are both equally eligible to be appointed to the board by the city council um, and can be interviewed by the city council. Any new potential applicants also need to be interviewed by this board. And then your recommendation will go to the city council about who you think should be appointed. 
Did I miss anything there, Anthony? Yeah, that'll carry some All these people want your seat. So I think what, 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 are you saying, Dave, that one or more of the terms are up before November 9th? No. Uh, I think it is before November 9th. Is it? Yeah. I think it's November. Do you recall the specific date? But it is November of this year. It is November. So we'll have to, we may be able to meet on the 9th, but I, I think we'll be need, needing to bring back reappointment um, actions for the At council. that meeting? Or in front of council? In front of council. In October? Yeah, we would do that ahead of time. Okay. Two term out in November. So, and the likelihood is that no other applicants are going to come forward between now and then, but we can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. And if there are no other applicants, obviously those two would just be subject to reappointment by city council. Nobody has to interview anybody. But if there are other applicants, we would have to schedule a, a meeting of this board to hear those other applicants. Have to be interviewed. Yeah, and we would have to council. do that prior to count prior to them ending their terms. Or is there any reason for it to do that, Anthony? I mean, if it can't be scheduled, I mean, if, yeah. Well, you know, if it, they can't have the interviews right before <laughs> terming, I mean, we can deal with that. Yeah, but could we We've sit on that that until We've done that in the past. We can process. Would we be That's able true. to sit at the November meeting though, if we yes. were yes. termed out? Yes. Thank you okay. for that. So even though you overstayed your term, you haven't been replaced, so you're still on the board. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Anthony. We'll and obviously, mm -hmm. this, you know, two members haven't had a chance to really dig in and get going on it, so I think that may carry some, carry some weight with the Yeah, and too. it was partially because of how the terms were set from yeah. the previous that they were I suspect to do the that. council would want to see the continuity on the board, even if there were others. Training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll stop losing board members. Um, uh, one thing I would like to say, we'll work on that information that several of the members uh, requested. We'll try to get that out to the entire board here shortly. Um, if you have any other requests between now and the next meeting date, um, please let um, myself or Kyle or, or You don't or Todd. have to wait for a meeting to request no. information. No, we're, we're here to help out. Um, that's really kind of how I look at our relationship staff and the board as we're a team. Um, and um, we're, we're here to help, and we're here to, to make your job as easy as it possibly can be. So, um, um, yeah, Are there just any let questions on um, next steps for this board? Everybody clear? Okay. Madam Chair. I entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I move that we adjourn. And a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye.